around biotech investment. We will also have the technology assessment sessions, both for new drug development and medical technologies. In these current sessions, we will address biotech evaluation and IPO. Now, Professor Che, the head of Kai's chair, will introduce the chair of the session. Please welcome Professor Chen. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Yangguk Cho of Global Venture Network. Uh, he graduated uh, Sogang University with bachelor's degree in biology. And also, he received a master's degree in biology at Sogang University and uh, MBA at Sogang University. And he also received PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology at Hanyang University. He has wide uh, industry experience, uh, starting from uh, a senior research scientist at Amure Pacific R&D Center. Uh, and he had positions at Pacific uh, Pharmaceutical Corporation, uh, Muri Technology Investment Corporation, uh, KIS, and uh, uh, Thera Gen Genetics and uh, Bioneer. And also, uh, <clears throat> he is currently uh, the CEO of Global uh, Venture Network and also a board member of CKD and uh, Optifar. He has uh, also some uh, investment track record. He had 30 plus biotech and pharma startups in Korea, uh, US, Israel, and Japan. And uh, he also helped uh, <coughs> invest, uh, investment in uh, 10 plus IPO and backdoor listing. And uh, he managed uh, three plus, I don't know what three plus means, but biotech based fund uh, fundraising and managed as a representative uh, at a uh, uh, representative level. And also 20 plus uh, directors of investi investi and advisory companies. Please welcome uh, Dr. Yongbuk Cho. Yes, thank you very much for your introduction. Thank you very much for your introduction. I'm going to speak to you in a few words. I've been working here in the past year, and I've been working here in the past year. I've been working here in the past year. I've been working here in the past year, and I've been working here in the past year. I've been working here in the past year, and I've been working here in the past year. I've been working here in the past year, and I've been working here in the past year. I've been working here in the past year, and I've been working here in the past year. 지금 해외에서 오신 분들이랑 사업분이시니까요. 도스토하고 좀 잘해주시기 바라고요. 어, 저는 아무래도 퍼시픽에서 지금 소개받은 대로 연구원으로 시작해서 한 7년 반 정도 신약개발 연구소에서 연구했었고요. 어, 태평양 마치고 나서는 지금 아무래도 퍼시픽이라고 하지만 그때는 태평양이었죠. 근데 지금 태평양 하면 태평양 너무 너무 이상하시는데 2000년부터 초기에 바이오분야 투자하는 펀드로 운영했었습니다. 그래서 한 5년 정도 국내 쪽 투자했었고요. 어느 정도 해외 투자하고 글로벌로 한 1,300개 정도 검토해서 40한 6,7개 정도 투자해서 상장을 한 25개 상장했는데요. 2005년도에 있다가 그 코스닥 본부에서 소개해 드린 게 있지만 기술성 상장 제도라고 하는 좀 국내 우리나라만의 좀 특별한 제도를 만든 그 틀을 잡아서 그 덕분에 제가 한 20몇 개를 지금 상장을 시켰어요. 그런 경험으로 지금 제가 맡은 세션은 아이오텍 이벨루에이션 앤 IPO인데요. 어, 우선 첫 번째 연작에서 데뷔 스파츠가 있다가 어, 미국의 투자 동향 그리고 상장 동향을 설명해 주실 거예요. 자료가 굉장히 좋습니다. 제가 어제 내용을 다 보니까요. 그리고 두 번째 연작에서는 KLX에서 나오셔서 우리나라만의 바이오텍 관련된 기술적 상장 제도의 변천과 현재 제도 상황을 설명드리겠습니다. 그리고 이런 제도를 통해서 상장을 작년에 성공했던 사실 기술로는 굉장히 수준이 높아서 연구 수준이 높으셨는데 여러 번 어려운 경험을 겪으셔서 이 제도를 통해서 작년에 상장하셨는데 그 기업 가치 협단이 초기 투자부터 IPO 상장할 때까지의 투자 과정을 그 유진상 박사님께서 나와서 설명해 주실 겁니다. 우선 첫 번째 연자 데이빗 슈퍼트 소개해 드리겠습니다. 작년에도 오셔서 또 발표를 해주셨는데요. 저희 그 유타에서 생물하고 척사를 하시고요. 
그다음에 MBA 가시고요. 지금 현재 예 지금 현재는 어, Accelerator Life Science Partner라는 ALSP에서 Chief Operating Partner를 경영하고 계시고요. 원래는 또 CEO도 맡으셨고요. 그 라이스 대학에 있는 그런 HATRC라고 하는 휴스턴 에리어 트랜스레이션 리서치 컨소시엄 이런 각 학교에서 기술을 사업하는 경험이라든지 이런 것들을 좀 많이 하셨었습니다. 그래서 아, 이런 경험들을 가지고 미국에서의 그 기술, 초기 기술을 어떻게 사업화하는지 하는 경험들을 작년에는 그 기술을 사업화하는 과정과 이런 경험들을 아주 소상히 설명해 주셔서 저희가 듣고 디스커션이 많았었는데요. 오늘은 이분이 이따가 나오셔서 미국에서 전반적인 기술 사업화 흐름과 상장하는 데 매년 지금 우리나라는 지금 상장을 어떤 해에는 10개 이상 어떤 해에는 2개 정도밖에 못하는데 미국에서는 지금 한해한 한 40개에서 70개까지 바이오텍 기업들이 상장을 합니다. 전체 테크놀로지 기업 한 100여 개 상장하는 거 보면 은 바이오텍이 그 중에 거의 반이나 반 이상을 차지하거든요. 매년 몇십 조씩 펀드레이딩 되고 있고 기업 하나당은 100억에서 200억 많은 뭐 2조짜리 펀드레이딩도 되고 있고 해서 그런 경험들을 가지고 시장 동향을 설명해 드릴 텐데 그러면 우리나라 입장에서는 아, 향후 우리가 10년, 20년 후에는 저런 수준의 그 기술 사업화 또는 상장, IPO 경험 되겠구나 하는 것들을 알수 있는데 어, 이따가 디스커션 할때그 주요 포인트로 좀 생각하실 게 아, 제가 투자하면서 보면은 국내에서는 사실은 2000년에 초기 투자할 때 국내는 보통 한 5천억에서 1조 5천억 정도 사이에 투자를 했었습니다. 벤처 펀드가 한 해. 그 벤처 캐피탈의 펀드로 따지면. 그런데 그 중에 바이오텍 분야 투자가 2%에서 8% 수준이었어요. 돈으로 따지면 200억에서 800억, 많으면 1000억 정도. 지금은 한 3조 정도, 지금 3조 정도 투자가 돼요. 바이오텍 전문 펀드로 따지면 작년에 데이터를 보니까. 이따가 잠깐 잠깐 뭐 데이터에도 나올 텐데요. 근데 전체 한 3조 투자되는 것 중에 바이오텍 분야가 얼마 정도 투자될까요? 제가 2000년에서 2000년에는 2에서 8% 정도 투자된다고 알고 있었는데 그 지금은 한 25% 정도 투자됩니다. 3조 바이오텍 펀드 중에는 7,500억 정도가 투자되는 거죠. 제가 최근에 어제저께 다시 들어보니까 거의 8천억 정도가 전발 그 투자 펀드 중에 바이오텍 분야 투자됐는데 그게 그 펀드로 구정, 구성된 분야이기 때문에 실제 민간에서 바이오텍 펀드 또는 IT 바이오텍 포함하는 벤처 펀드 중에 그 정도이기 때문에 그렇게 구성되지 않은 일반 다른 자금들 프라이빗 에코티 자금들까지 포함하는 실제로는 작년에 1조 이상이 바이오텍 분야에 투자됐습니다. 그래서 최근에 여러분이 걱정하시는 대로 코롱 생명과학의 이런 여러 가지 좀안 좋은 문제라든지 임상에 실패한 경우라든지 라이센스 아웃됐던 것들이 뭐 일부 실패한다든지 하는 그 투자하는 사람들의 센티멘트는 갑자기 떨어져가지고 일반적인 바이오텍 기업들이 전부 다 20% 30%씩 가라앉는 경우가 있는데요. 그 사실은 이게 그 성장 통계라고 보여집니다. 미국은 이따가 설명이 좀 나오겠지만 PR 레이셔가 바이오텍 기업들이 20내외예요 PER의 왕 프라이스 어닝 레이션이니까 수입 곱하기 몇이 그 회사의 기업 가치냐. 그런데 기기라드나 세일즈 같은 데는 30조 파는데 한 10조 인간다. 그러면 기업 가치가 100조예요. 그럼 퍼가 10밖에 안 되는 거거든요. 10이나 24인데 우리나라는 수익이 안 나니까 퍼가 안 나오는 경우도 있지만 수익이 조금 나는데 퍼가 100이나 200이에요. 그래서 사람들이 많은 경우에 우리가 한 다섯 배 이상 기업 가치가 부풀려진 거 아니냐 하는데 제가 예전에 이제 발표하려고 정리했던 자료들을 보면 은 미국도 바이오텍 분야의 성장기에서 보통 이렇게 S커브를 그리잖아요. 성장 초기에는 수익이 나는 기계아드 같은 경우도 98년, 99년에는 아직 수익이 나기 전이었잖아요. 2000년 되면서 이제 수익이 많이 시작했는데 그 당시에 어울리 스테이지에는 기업 가치가 50, 100이었습니다. 
근데 점점 커지고 사이즈가 커지고 수익이 안정화되면서 퍼가 50, 30, 2 0으로 내려졌으니까 지금 우리나라가 좀 기업가치를 높게 받는 거는 큰 거품이나 뭐큰 그 나중에 사단이나 문제가 아니라 성장하는 과정에 성장 초기 단계라고 보시면 될것 같습니다. 그거를 좀 명확하게 볼수 있는 게 프랑스나 독일이나 영국의 유럽의 바이오텍 기업들을 보면 퍼가 한 20에서 한40 사이거든요. 그러니까 우리는 한 50에서 100 사이고 유럽 기업들은 20에서 4, 4 50 사이고 미국 기업들은 10에서 20 정도. 약간은 우리가 그 전반적인 시장의 흐름을 보면 매우 초기에 있기 때문에 그런 성장성을 갖고 있다고 보시면 될것 같고요. 그리고 최근에 한미가 2014년에 기술 이전을 6개 하면서 전체 가치 7조 5천억, 8조 가까이를 기술 이전 하고 나서 그 시절에 유한양행은 매출은 1조를 달성해서 굉장히 파티였는데 수익성도 좋았는데 신약 개발은 없어서 기업 가치가 2조 정도밖에 안 되고 한미는 갑자기 2조밖에 안 되는 회사가 그런 신약 개발 라이센스 아웃을 7조, 8조 단위로 하고 나니까 그때 당시에 기업 가치가 한미하고 한미 사이에서 합쳐서 거의 7조, 8조, 15조가 됐어요. 기업 가치 1조 언제 됐던 회사가 거의 한 10배 이상 커졌죠. 그러니까 사람들이 전부 다 어, 넥스트 한미는 어디냐. 그래서 그 다음, 그 다음부터는 매출액 대비 수익률을 따지는 게 아니라 매출액 대비 연구개발비 사용액을 따지기 시작했어요. 그래서 유한양이 그때 당시에 매출액이 1조가 넘었는데 연구개발비는 300억 조금 넘게 썼거든요. 그래서 그때 사람들이 유한양이 알고 보니까 해외에서 들어온 매출이 60%고 국내에서 자기들 생산한 분은 40%밖에 안 되고 연구개발비는 3%밖에 안 쓰고 그러고 나서 이제 찾으니까 LG가 연구개발비 1 0 썼었고 종근당 제가 사회에 자라있었던 종근당이 뭐 18년 정도 넘게 썼고 그러니까 사람들이 이제 포커스를 바꾸기 시작했는데 그 2014년부터 15, 16 지나가면서 유한양행이 전략을 바꿨죠. 내부에서 짧은 시간에 빨리 연구개발을 할수 없으니까 외부에 벤처들에 투자해서 공동 개발을 하자 하고 했던 게 최근에 결과가 나오기 시작했어요. 3년 전부터 기술 이전을 하고 게다가 이제 어제 그저께 큰 어, 8.7 빌리언 어, 8,600억이죠. 어, 그러니까 한 거의 10조 정도 되는 아 1조 정도 되는 1조 정도 되는 길을 내시는데 이제 동물 실험 단계 하고 있는데 얼리 스테이지인데 결과들이 좋아서. 라이센스 아웃을 했습니다. 그래서 전반적으로 그런 음, 트렌드가 각 개별 아이템적으로는 물론 중간중간에 라이센스 아웃이 실패하거나 또는 됐던 게 돌아오거나 임상 단계 다음 단계 못 돌아오는 게 개별적으로 있을 수 있지만 전반적으로 큰 리스크가 있다든지 그렇게 생각하는 것보다는 성장하는 과정에 뭐 실수도 있을 수 있고 또는 확률적으로 실패할 수도 있으니까 그걸 좀잘 지켜보시고요. 지금 이제 대기 오셨으니까 아, 지금 준비됐나요? 아유, 빅터? 예, 그러면 박수를 맞아주시기 바랍니다. 첫 연자 박수 맞아주세요. 굿 모닝. 음, my apologies for being late. 음, um, I could have sworn it said 10, but clearly I'm, uh, I'm still maybe on US time. So thank you uh, for uh, coming. Thank you to my colleague, uh, Su Chang Che, for inviting me again this year. It's a pleasure to be back in Seoul, a place where I've been fortunate to come many times, and I'm very happy to be back. So uh, today, I was asked to uh, talk about the current situation for IPOs in the US. If for, was anybody here last year? If you were here last year, raise your hand. Good, then you don't know who I am. Uh, so. I tend to take a little bit of a different approach to these things. I want to try to make this enjoyable. I uh, want to make certain parts of it memorable and other parts of it not very memorable. I will also try to remember that um, some of you are listening to me on translation. And last year, the translator told me that I was talking very, very, very fast. And so I will do my best to go a little bit slower. Um, Today, I'm here to talk about the IPO process in the US, kind of what's going on and the, the trends that we're seeing in the United States. But quickly, just to talk about
Ah, here we go. So just a little bit about what my firm does. My firm is Accelerator Life Science Partners. We are a venture capital firm based in New York, Seattle, San Diego, and with an outpost office in Houston, Texas. We really work on bringing a number of things together to catalyze for our investors. They include venture capital from top tier venture capitalists, and we'll talk about who those investors are. An experience management team, and I'll show you who some of my partners are. Scientific expertise from scientific advisors and from our pharma partner investors. And turnkey facilities in all of those geographies. We've been doing this for about 15 years, and we've raised about $400 million to support a variety of companies. Our current syndicate of investors includes large pharma companies, AbV, Eli Lilly, Johnson & Johnson, and Pfizer, four of the 15 biggest pharma companies in the world. Um, our CRO partner includes Wuxi Pharmatech, the world's largest manufacturer of drugs, a partnership fund for New York City, and additional venture capital groups, including Arch Venture Partners and Alexandria Real Estate Equities, which are the top two performing life science funds over the last five years. My partners include some of these people. I won't go through all of them all, and then we have operating partners in each of our geographies. But our business model is really based upon investing super early. So I know we're here to talk about risk and some of the ways that we manage risk, but the big portion of our business is risk, and we are accepting of it. And so what we are really doing is taking the time and effort to invest in early stage technologies that are not me too kind of companies. They are not going to do a bio better. It's not going to go after um, a similar target that someone else is pursuing. We're really going after first in class. We build all of our companies from scratch, and so we are really looking for that brilliant scientific entrepreneur at a university somewhere, or a scientific entrepreneur that's inside of a pharma company, where we are seeking to do world-class ideas. And then we set aside, we have a bunch of different resources that we bring to bear to make these companies potentially be successful. Our existing investments out of this current fund include all of these. You'll see from a number of different academic institutions, just a couple to highlight. Petra Pharma, Lewis Cantley, and Nathaniel Gray. Lewis, Lewis Cantley is well known for establishing the PI3 kinase pathway. Sean Brady, Lodo Therapeutics. It's a company where we have a partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as a billion dollar deal with Genentech, working in infectious disease, as well as oncology. Uh, Proneris, which is a deal that we have with the United States government, leveraging $90 million of investment from them, working on exposure to uh, refractory seizures following nerve gas exposure. And then finally, Magnolia Neurosciences, which is working on uh, neurodegeneration uh, targets uh, in both cancer chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathies as well as traditional neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the U.S. And let's just remember that this is my opinion. So remember, you take it for what it is worth. Just a couple of things to think about what's been going on in the U.S. We've seen an unprecedented rally in the stock market. The bull market, for those of you who are financial people, bull markets are up markets. Bear markets are down markets. The bull market has been running for about 10 years. What started the, bear, the bull market was the ending of what was known in the U.S. was the financial crisis, a very big bust in housing. And so money that was being loaned by the federal government and the Federal Reserve got very, very cheap to borrow. And so that, by definition, pushes equities, stocks, higher. So the, mar the metrics that we use for measuring stock market performance includes the S&P 500, which, so my apologies that I made this presentation a week ago because Suchan made, made me turn this in a week ago. So I'll give a couple of updates. The S&P 500 hit its all-time high in June. It hit its all-time high again this morning. I did not close at it its all-time high. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, the broader view of the stock market, has hit its all-time high. The first half of this year, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was up 14.5%. So 
14.5% on a half a year performance would be well enough for many people who are financial managers to retire after that one great year. The NASDAQ, the technology heavily weighted index, broke 8,000, it closed above 8,000 this, this afternoon in New York. And Bitcoin, which I know is one of these cryptocurrencies where people think that it's real or not real, I don't know if it's real, but I know that it went from 3,000 at the beginning of the year to 11,000 uh, just the other day. It went all the way up to 13 until it caved back a little bit. So what we're seeing is a tremendous amount of money flowing in the market. Drivers of the rally in the United States. 3.6% unemployment rate. The United States traditionally has unemployment at about 5%. It hasn't been that low in 50 years. So everyone who is working, who wants to work, is working. Cheap money, as I mentioned before, the federal government is in charge of loaning money and it creates higher interest rates to tighten the supply of money. Money has been very cheap for 10 years and it is still very cheap at about 4%. There is talk about lowering the interest rate again that this month because the economy in the U.S. is looking like it is cooling. After 10 years, one would think that it would be cooling. But this is also drives people to continue to invest in equities. Cheap oil. So the United States is now the largest exporter of oil in the world. While most of Asia gets its gas and oil from the Middle East, the United States is very self-sufficient in supplying its own oil, and that's largely due to fracking. And so the price of oil has been traditionally much, much lower than when my colleague George and I worked in Houston. It was $150 a barrel. Today it's $60 a barrel. So that pushes the cost of transportation and transporting goods down substantially. It also gives consumers a lot more money in their pocket to not be spending on gas. Consumer and confidence in spending. The American consumer is spending with both hands right now. Uh, there is a great deal of consumer confidence that things are just going to continue to roll on. We'll talk about that. Stock buybacks. And so the United States changed its tax policy last year that allowed the corporate tax rates in the United States to be cut dramatically from about 35% to 20%. And so what many larger companies have been doing, big biotech companies as well as big tech companies, is taking that money that they're not paying in taxes and buying their own shares back, pushing the price of their stock up, and then pushing up their dividends. That makes more companies to be more attractive to investing in and having the idea that equities are going to continue to rise. And then finally, the booming IPO market. So a couple of things to think about as I say all of this good news. There are some undercurrents to the market, some things that are happening that are challenging as we look out around the IPO forecast. The US versus China. While the news over the weekend was considered a positive, I would argue that it wasn't really any news at all and that this matter still exists. There is an American saying, it's called kicking the can down the road. We are just waiting for another time to come and address this. The trade deficit, the trade war with the US, between the US and China is very real. Not that I am a soothsayer or a person that can make predictions, but you will see corporate profits get hit very hard this quarter by the trade war, by the cost of doing business going substantially higher due to tariffs. If the trade war persists, you could see consumer, corporate profits get hit and then consumer spending slow. Consumer spending has already slowed in China. Factory output has already slowed in China. The US versus Iran. This is also a real problem. This morning, our president made a couple of more interesting statements saying that Iran is playing with fire. This situation is not just simply going to go away. And so there will be some sort of uh, conflict in which it, this gets addressed. The likely outcome of that is instability in the Middle East, 
which none of us want, uh, as well as the likely higher, in cost, higher costs of, of oil in Asia. The bottom one is funny, but it's not funny. The US versus everyone. We are starting trade wars with a variety of people, including some of our closest allies, including this country for a little bit. That seems to have calmed down, but we certainly still have a major problem with Mexico and Canada when it comes to our trade, as well as all of Europe. Other major undercurrent is in the US, the political election of 2020. Donald Trump is going to run for president versus someone. He's currently running against 25 different people. Now, in our country, we would like to think that we'll figure that out in the next 18 months, um, but it will be a very difficult process. The rising federal deficit. The deficit in the US is at $25 trillion. It's going to continue to increase because of we are not bringing in as much money as we thought we would as part of the tax cuts. At some point, that 25 trillion is going to become 20, 28 trillion and then it's 30 trillion and at some point it's going to have to be addressed. Maybe. The pending budget show, shut down. The United States is going to have a budget, a smaller budget crisis since September if Congress doesn't approve a new budget. We've already had a budget showdown at the end of last year and that led to the government being closed down for 25 days which was one of the most unpopular things that occurred in our country over the last several years. And you'll see that in some of the IPO statistics that we talk about. The big risk right now in the US, in the IPO market, is that the bear is going to burst the bubble. You didn't ask, but in my, in my speaker notes that I was sent, it was suggested of whether or not the US IPO market is a bubble. It absolutely is a bubble. The question of whether or not the Korean IPO market is a bubble for biotech isn't my thing to decide. It's something that we can happily discuss today, but I, I don't know as much about that as much as I think I know about what's happening in the US. To put it mildly, the US IPO market is extremely active. In the second quarter, as of last Tuesday, there was 54 IPOs. There were four more on Friday, so there was 58. You will note that in the first quarter, there was only 18. There was only 18 in the first quarter because the federal government was shut down for 25 days and could not process the paperwork for IPOs. So you will note that at 58, we're almost at 60, the highest amount that there was in 2018. Extremely high profile companies have gone public recently in the US, ones that you know, Uber, Slack, CloudStrike, Zoom, Beyond Meat, which imagine Americans are starting to become a little bit vegetarian as driven and Beyond Meat is the highest performing stock on the NASDAQ this year. In fact, Beyond Meat is having a supply problem because it cannot make its meatless burgers fast enough. Um, and then um, other companies like uh, Pinterest, which is very consumer driven. The biotech IPO market is extremely healthy. In 2017, there were 40 IPOs. 2018, there were 56. Year to date, there was 22 as of last Tuesday. The four that I mentioned earlier, all four priced on Friday were all biotech IPOs. Two very large ones in the $300 million range. But let's look back for one second. In 2018, there were some of the most high profile biotech IPOs imaginable. First and foremost was Moderna. I really do like that guy with the unicorn spreading money because that's kind of the way that the, the whole Moderna story was. This is a company that had raised north of $2 billion in venture capital and went public at an $8 billion valuation at $23 a share. Today it closed at fourteen forty-seven. Twenty-three minus fourteen is a is a lot and you're talking about you've lost billions of dollars in market cap around some a little bit weaker than expected cancer data. Ruby is very high profile companies focusing on tagging red cells with oxygen and making that a therapeutic. Two billion dollar valuation 
raised $250 million and is now at $14. The best performer of the unicorns is Allergen, a company working on gene and cell therapy, the team from Kite Therapeutics, which sold itself to Gilead for $11 billion two years ago, got the band back together and went out and raised $300 million in an IPO after raising $500 million of private money and has seen their valuation increase by 50%. But it's the few and far between. Record-breaking amounts of money are pouring into venture capital in the United States. If you look at the statistics, $12 billion in 2017 was thought that it would be the highest amount ever until 2018, when $17.7 .7 billion flew into the biotech market from venture deals. The money has to get put to work somewhere, and it's getting put to work in companies that they can foresee being able to take public, especially when the window is open. This much money in the system has to show, along with favorable conditions, makes an IPO quite logical. In general, where things are at in the US right now with valuations is that IPOs are happening. In order to get VC-like returns, venture capitalists need to have at least a two, if not a three or greater X multiple on their returns. And so you need to be able to keep your investments limited to between 100 and $250 million in. Certainly there are exceptions to that. You see companies like, does anyone know what Grail is? Grail is a company that's looking to develop a diagnostic, a pan-diagnostic from blood, a Theranos that actually works. <laughs> so they've raised $1.2 billion. So that company has to go out at a four to six billion dollar valuation in order to satisfy the VCs who are in that deal. In general, you need to keep your raises between 150 and 250 million dollars. The other thing is, and I don't know if this is the way that it is here in Korea, but VCs in the US do not necessarily view an IPO as an exit. It's another financing opportunity for the company. Most VCs keep aside large amounts of money to put into a company at an IPO. Further, many VCs are holding their stocks well after the period of time in which they are allowed to sell, which is normally six months in the US. I know it's between six months and a year here. What we're seeing valuations being driven by is comparables by stages. And so because there's a large amount of IPO activity in the United States, it's easy to see what something should be valued at. If a company's at a discovery stage, it's going to be valued less than a company would be in an IND enabled or a phase one, two, three scenario. We're also seeing platforms being considered to be much more valuable than single product stories. This is a pendulum that swings in the United States on a very regular basis. Sometimes products are, are favorable and sometimes platforms are favorable. Platforms are very favorable right now, particularly in gene editing, which everyone's looking for a better CRISPR, or something that looks like CRISPR, or something that is CRISPR, that's called something that's not CRISPR, that doesn't uh, interfere with intellectual property from two major universities in the United States. Um, but gene editing remains to be a very hot space. Gene therapy and cell therapy are the two top performing sectors right now, which if you had told us that five years ago, we never would have believed it, especially with things like gene therapy, which lost a great deal of its fashion uh, after a number of high profile failures, but another gene therapy company called Prevail Therapeutics just went public last week at a $700 million valuation. And so you're seeing premiums paid for these hot sectors. And then no biotech presentation anywhere on this planet can be given without saying the words immuno-oncology. Immuno-oncology is the hottest, fattest part of the market right now. It is also the most crowded. And so if you are looking at immuno-oncology assets, it's very challenging to figure out how these, these programs are gonna be used with existing IO franchise drugs. I forget the exact number, but I know that um, 
Bristol is, is sponsoring over 500 different clinical trials with different agents along with their IO molecules. But IO platforms are also extremely valuable. The IPO market in the US is always driven by what the market will bear. Getting the highest price is what the end goal is. And so is the data clear and compelling is always the first question. Marginal IPOs are not getting done. What we're seeing is, is that the good investments that were made by VCs somewhere between the 2012 and 2016 period are starting to pay out. They're paying out with having data that's mature enough in most cases, unless it's gene editing cell therapy or gene therapy, uh, to be able to delineate whether or not that data is solid. Investors are required to take a longer term orientation. As I mentioned, our, IPO, our BC investors do not view an IPO as an exit. They are not selling on, at the sixth month. They are not selling at the twelfth month. In fact, our venture partners, our, our longest and most substantial investor, who's just raised another billion and a half, lead investor in Grail, doesn't sell. They hold, which is why they made on a $150 million investment in Juno, why they took home over $900 million. It's a longer term orientation. You're also not dealing with a lot of retail investors. The sophistication of the buyer in these, in these situations is very high. There are no, what are known as crossover funds, where you're seeing very sophisticated healthcare investors that have rooms full of bright scientists who are analyzing data and they're investing earlier and earlier as well as at the IPO. And having these crossover investors involved is becoming incredibly important to making this story solid enough to take it public and be able to survive in the aftermarket. And what we're seeing is, is that underwriters in, of, in New York and San Francisco are having a level of sophistication to go out and be able to sell the quality of deal that they are looking to sell. But what we've seen over the last five years is a greater sophistication of the, of the funds that are actually buying these offerings. We know that the pharmaceuticals industry requires that biotech be healthy. And so the biotech icebreaker that exists for pharma is only becoming more and more valuable as more than 60% of the products that have been launched by pharma over the last five years have been have been created by biotechnology companies and not by big pharma. I'm happy to have a conversation about this aspect of it now, but perhaps maybe after the following speaker might be an, a, a more interesting way to delineate um, the differences between the way that the, the IPO market is looking in the US versus it's looking in Korea. The final note that I would say is, is as an American in, an investor who watches the IPO market very carefully and who has one of our companies that's teeing up to go public before the end of the year, this will all come to an end. And so I think you will see over the next six months a number of more companies trying to get out the door before the financial picture in the US changes substantially. So, Suchan, questions now or? After the two more. Sure, great. Thank you all very much. Thank you, David. Because uh, we are running out of time, 저희 30분 정도 늦어져가지고요. 다음 두 주제 더 발표하시고, 그다음에 요 세션의 세 주제를 같이 디스커션을 한 10분 정도 해야 될것 같습니다. 다음 주제 발표는 그 양현채 기자님께서 한국 바이오 IPO 성취와 우리 남은 이슈들에 대해서 설명해 주실 건데요. 한국에서 그냥 확보하시고. 이스콘신에서 MB 하시고 삼성 생명에 처음 95년에 조인했다가 한국 코리안 스타트 엑스체인지에 99년에 조인해서 지금은 기술 성장, 기술 상장 기업 심사부에 계십니다. 박수를 받아주시기 바랍니다.